All right, welcome to another episode of Gaudier or Nay. I'm here with John Molston. John, thanks for joining me, my man. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm pumped to uh, see you. It's been a while. Yeah, buddy. Uh, no, it's, it has been a while. Uh, you're like, I think we met first time in Toronto um, when I first moved there. And uh, you were already like uh, really cracking into the scene. You were starting shows. You were like really, uh, it seemed like you were coming into your own. So like, it, yeah, it really sucked. This lockdown must have been shit timing for yourself, eh? <laughs> oh, I, I know that that's that's like the thing that annoys me the most was I was just really starting to get like, like really enjoy stand up, but also like start getting somewhere myself. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it just kind of felt, I was like, oh, I got a bit of momentum going. And then lockdown happened and I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, you're just like, oh yeah, reality. I, I forgot about that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't want me to have anything nice. Fucking. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> uh, dude, um, you have a great story though. And uh, that's one of the reasons I really wanted you on the podcast. Um, why, why don't you tell my audience a little bit of your background, where you came from and uh, yeah, like where you are now and uh, what you're kind of doing and working cool. on. Cool. Um, so uh, as you can hear, I'm originally from uh, Scotland. I'm, I, I'm from Glasgow in Scotland. I moved to Canada 10 years ago in January. It was my 10 years. Um, I basically moved to Canada. Like everyone always asks me why I moved to Canada. And, and honestly, I don't really have like a, a, an interesting story in terms of it was mostly like I was just trying to get away from my life you know what I mean and I was like and then someone was like oh you can go and I, I didn't I, the only place I could go to that I could get a work holiday visa for for like longer than a couple of months was Canada like an English speaking place you know and um, then the reason why I went to Toronto was because it was basically the cheapest flight if it had been in, it was the cheapest flight in Canada. So I was like, I'll go to Toronto. And it's it's so funny because I didn't know I didn't know anything about Canada, like at all. Like we don't, I don't know, like we just don't hear much about Canada because I guess America kind of takes uh, the and a, anyone who's yeah. Canadian kind of gets lumped into sort of an American of thing, course, I think, back home. So I didn't really know much. I didn't know anyone here. Um I first I, I didn't research it either back then. I mean, thinking back then of like my mindset was ridiculous. I had I just assumed that Canada was going to be a very cheap place to live, especially Toronto, right? <laughs> Which is like <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious now to think about it. So I turn up, I turned up with a thousand Canadian dollars. That's Ooh. all the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's all the money I had. And within two weeks I was broke. And yeah, you could like rent out a closet for a month with that kind of money. <laughs> I know. And even I, back then I, I found a place for like 500 bucks. And then after just like, and it was the middle of winter too. So I turned up, I got off the plane. I remember it was minus 27 and I had never, exp I didn't know that that such a thing existed. And I got off the plane and I was just like, what the hell is going on? And then for weeks I was just walking around downtown just like, because I was in the financial district, I was like, where is everyone? I just assumed that everything was in the city center. Like that's because back home, like there's a city center, like Glasgow has a city center and every, all the shops are there. All the people kind of live there. Everything happens there. So in my head, I was just like, well, I'll just go down to the city center and see about getting a job and I'll meet people. And I was walking around the financial district <laughs> in the middle of winter time, just be like, where is everyone? Toronto <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i um so so i did that and um i was i was here for i i originally had only planned on being here for a year my i didn't really have a plan my plan kind of was like i have a year's visa i'll go to toronto i'll maybe go to like new york chicago travel around canada just just for something to do for a year and come Oh, John. Party, all right. I just drink drugs, just like insane lifestyle. Hey, John. Uh, and I think like when I look back on that in reflection hey, John, now. John, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, the thing just, uh, yeah, something just happened for a sec there. Um, can you go back? You were saying like, uh, I, I, only, I only wanted to come here for a year. That's where you cut off for a sec. 
Oh shit, you cut off again. All right. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I I don't know what happened. I think uh, my connection went down. Yeah. You're back. Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, you're like coming you're still, in loud and clear. I don't know uh, what happened. I, I'm still recording everything. Okay. So that, that's no problem. I could just. Do you uh, edit it? Or, yeah, yeah. That's that's okay, cool, cool, cool. out. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, where I lost you was that um, you said I was only planning to come here for a year. And then that's where you kind of lost. Okay. It. So, yeah. I, I So, originally, I was only planning to come for a year. I had to kind of lose. I, I was like, I just want to get out of my life, basically, because at the time I was like doing a lot of drugs and I was drinking a lot. And, you know, I, I didn't I didn't when I look back on that time, I think I was subconsciously trying to get away. I didn't think I didn't think that at the time, but I was like trying to escape the sort of like life I created back home, which was becoming sort of uncontrollable. But at, at the time, I was like, I'll go away for a year and hopefully We'll see what happens. That's kind of what my vibe was. And my, my plan was to just come to Toronto, figure it out, travel, see what happens. And that was it. That was all That was all I had in my mind. And that was 10 years ago. And then I stayed. So basically, I stayed for another year. Um, and then, yeah. And then what actually happened was, you know, I st instead of like getting away from my life, I just kind of like came to Toronto and met similar people and got into a similar scene of like drinking drugs debauchery because that's all I knew so then I was just in Toronto for a couple of years doing that um and then I was just like this is this is crazy what am I doing um and then by that time I'd been here three or four years just like passed by and then I started uh what actually happened was I started getting into comedy that's what kind of changed everything in my life um previous to coming to canada i mean i'd always love stand-up but i never thought i was never i, I just never thought that stand-up was an option i never even thought about it as a job or anything and i used to go to comedy clubs all the time that's what i used to love doing just I had any any excuse anytime i had a date i go to a comedy club anytime we were going out for the night i'd be like let's go to the comedy club first and just before i moved to canada i remember thinking I want to do this. I just mm. thought, I remember thinking I can, I want to do that, but I didn't know how, because I didn't have any friends in the industry. It, I mean, 10, 10 or 11 years ago, it wasn't like it is now. There's, I mean, we weren't using social media as much. There wasn't like comedy courses. There wasn't like a network really, which is mind blowing to think even back then. Um, and, um, and I just kind of put it to the back of my mind. And then I came to Canada, I got into like a, bad relationship with someone and then I was just kind of and then by the time I'd sort of like a few years ago gone by I was just kind of I was in a relationship we broke up and then I kind of realized I was just on my own and I didn't know anyone in Toronto and you'll know from moving in Toronto it's Toronto is kind of a tough town to live when you don't know anyone oh it's very tough and uh, right. to make and to make friends in it um it's just the friends come and go so much like every it's such a fast-paced life um, and everybody like, cause the thing is everybody moves to Toronto, like so many people to like get ahead in some sense. Right. Yeah. And like, so they're just, everybody's so focused on themselves 
and uh, which is fine. I did the same thing. And I bet you did a little bit of it yourself when you started like uh, really focusing on shit. But like that makes it really hard to like keep friends for like long periods of time because like you well, might have a friend for like a few months and then it just kind of that relationship starts like dying. Well, that's exactly what happened. I met like I was almost ready to go home because I was like, fuck this. Because like back in Glasgow and it might be the same out, out west or anywhere that's not Toronto. Right. But like you go to a pub or you go out for the night you meet people and then the next thing you know you're friends with them and you're you know you're and it's kind of there's a big culture of like socializing like that the pub pub culture right and when i came to toronto i was like i'll just go to a few bars that look cool and i'll hang out and i'll meet people and you start trying to talk to people and they're just kind of like a little standoffish which i always find weird about toronto because no one's actually from toronto so you, you think that people would want to make friends you know ha, 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 yeah, but yeah even 10 years later i still have people i know people complain about that all the time and the only reason that i have any friends is because of comedy because if i think about friends i have outside the comedy there's not a lot and um so yeah i was kind of just i was i was kind of just on my own i mean i'd had an, I, I mean i was drinking a lot and i kind of had enough of it and and I didn't know what to do. So I, 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 what I actually started doing was I started going to stand up shows and just, just so that I had something to do. And I go myself. I was at, you ever know those guys that go to open mics and you just were like, why is this guy at an open mic? There was like three people there. Do you know what <laughs> I mean? I was that guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which is funny to think back. I used to go to everything. I was always that, you know, those shows that no one would show up to, but there was just one weird guy that yeah. turns up. Yeah. I was that weird guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's who that guy is. All right. I know, right? But <laughs> uh, but uh, but even at the time, I was kind of still like, I was. I was. I mean, I didn't really think too much about actually doing stand up until I was kind of. I don't know. This took a while, and then eventually, like, I just started making friends with stand ups because they thought I was a comic because I was just always at these open mics and stuff. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, they started out. So when you up? <laughs> yeah. And then, so that went on for a couple of years and I started doing a little bit of comedy, just doing a, a couple of open mics here and there. Like, but it wasn't like, you know, these people that start doing comedy and then they're like, I fell in love and then I just did it every night. That wasn't like that for me. Basically, I did that for a couple of years, like doing like an open mic, maybe every couple of months, not really writing material, just kind of doing it, but like not really um but I could because at the time i was like i was in a really bad way i was like drink drugs just my life in general was chaotic mm. and i was just a, a real mess till finally what happened was so i'd been here by that time i'd been here for four years i'd been doing a little bit of stand-up for like maybe a year or so on and off maybe and i'd done like maybe 10 sets in like two years do you know what I mean yeah um and then finally i was here without a visa like I was on here, I was here with a holiday visa and I was like, I can't stay here anymore because I can't, like, I can't, you know, I was like 35 years old or whatever. I was like, I can't live here without a visa and no purpose. And, but I was starting to really kind of like enjoy the, the stand up scene here. And so what I did was I went home. Um, I saved up some money and then I came back here to do the Humber comedy uh, writing program because and the reason why i did that was for a visa it wasn't because i was like oh, i want to study comedy it was just kind of like i'll use this as a visa so that i get that visa go to college you get a visa after that to work and then you can apply for permanent residency so i mm -hmm. thought in my mind i was like well that gives me another four years um but then what actually happened that, and going to humber um comedy school actually was what changed everything in my life um, because when I got there again, I was a mess. I was just a mess. I was like, I'd be like doing Coke and after hours to six in the morning and then going to school, you know, mm -hmm. or missing classes because of like, just like, just a, a ridiculous lifestyle. And I was like, what, why am I, why did I save up all this money to come back? And I'm still doing the same thing that I was doing. And then it, then what happened during Humber was uh, the Humber course, you get to do everything. You do stand up, you do acting, you do improv, you do sketch writing. Um, so you get to see the whole industry of comedy, which is stuff I'd never done before. The only 
stage performance I'd done as a little bit of stand up. So this was a new world for me. And it was, I, I don't know, it was, uh, it was hard. And then I was kind of ready to quit. And then we had an end of year show. And for some reason, I was in a lot of this end of year show, even though I don't think I was the best student in the class, I just happened to have all these parts. And we did this show in front of like 200 students. And I fucking like everything I did, it was, it just killed. And it just, for some reason, just all sort of came together. I'd never been on stage like that before. Um, and after that, all the teachers were like, oh, you're really good. You, you, you know, you, you've got a future in this if you want it. Um, and just stuff. And it gave me this new confidence I'd never had. And if it was the first time in my life that I thought, oh, I'm actually good at something and I can pursue a career and something that I'm actually interested in, not because I'd always kind of been fighting the nine to five job life, you know, it never really it suited me. And so then that, that took about a year. And then I was in the second year of that course, I, I, I started a sketch group. And then I just started like becoming more and more engrossed in the community and stand up. And but I was still really I was still drinking a lot. And I was still doing a lot of drugs. And I just got to the point where I was like, you know what, if I don't stop drinking, then I'm going to ruin this. I'm going to ruin this opportunity. Um, and so I quit. And that, and I've, and that's, I've just, I think that I, on November there, I was four years sober, uh, which is, is amazing because I'd never, I'd never, before that, I'd never thought that I would live a life without alcohol or that I would be doing, I'd be living a creative life of, being a comedian and doing like just this amazing life. So um, yeah, and that, that, that just, that was basically what happened. That was the first five or six years in, in Toronto. It was like crazy at first. Then as soon as I got community and that's what they always say in the, like the, 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 the recovery community is like, you know, it's like um, addiction is like people that are just lost. They, they're looking, they need the sim, you know, they just don't have their community, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I found with stand up. So I, then I realized I was like, oh, I don't need to drink to have friends. I don't need to drink to be sociable. I don't need to drink to have confidence. It's like, I actually, I'm involved in the thing and people like me and I'm good at this and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I quit. That's, that's, that's what happened. And that was four years ago. So yeah, that's my and story. And so that, yeah. That's impressive. And like the one thing that's really impressive is like you said, that you stayed into the comedy community. And when I first moved here, you were sober and working as a bartender at one of the like clubs <laughs> for like a part-time job, weren't you? Yeah, I was working at the Ossington, yeah. People always actually said to me, is it hard to work in a bar when you're sober? And it's like, it's actually easier because you get to see how gross drinking is, you know, from like a sober point of view where there's people just drinking and getting hammered or like smelling booze smelling without drinking. Booze, yeah. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. Like you pour a vodka and you're just like, this fucking smells like bleach. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know why people <laughs> would drink this. So it was never tempting, but yeah, I used to work at the Ossington and then they had the comedy show there. So that was good. But yeah. Yeah. So that kind of was like what comedy basically, I know this sounds like hyperbole or whatever, but comedy basically saved my life because I don't think, had I not done that, I think I would still be in the, I mean, I don't even know uh, because I don't recognize that person from four years ago or five years ago or whatever. It seems like a whole different. Oh yeah. Right. Well, honestly, like, I think that's one thing we have to like understand is just people now is like, you're never going to be the same. Your personality is a constantly changing thing. Like, yeah. and that matters. If like matters, what choices, if you, if you kept down the drinking route, you would have still been a different person than four years ago. It just could have went a completely different direction, right? Yeah, and I don't, I, I don't think I would have been doing what I've been doing in comedy or in life. Or, um, I, I think I would. I don't, I don't know. I, I think my life would still be chaotic. I'd maybe, I'd maybe still try to do a bit of comedy, but I don't. Or I might have just gone back home. Or who knows? It was. It, it, it's uh, stopping drinking. It, changed my life completely mm -hmm. and uh the one thing uh you said uh when i was you were telling your story um when you went and did that show after the humber college thing you said there was like 200 people this yeah. is the first time people came up to you afterwards and really gave you kind of that encouragement and shit like that and that really kind of 
like kind of altered your almost your direction in life kind of going like okay you know what this is actually like a complete like this is something we could do it's actually like that is something I find like interesting because like I've heard this kind of thing said so many times like so many young people they just don't get told like or given encouragement about uh, like anything in life sometimes yeah. like they just they they grow up they've never had any of that and like you know they stay in like some of those chaotic kind of worlds that they end up creating for themselves because they never get a chance to get any direction so like I can see like how that could have been so powerful for you like you you made a big move to come to Toronto to do like the course and like you were still in that kind of like wobbly area of like I still have my party life. I'm still like doing this. Like, I'm not sure if I'm like comedy is my thing, but then you did hit this one thing. And then all of a sudden you get this encouragement. It completely changes the course of your life. It gives you that confidence. Like, I, I think that's like such a powerful thing. Well, see, that's just exactly it. So where I'm from in Glasgow, it's just a very, the culture back then was basically like, you know, don't have dreams, just get a job in a factory or a call center, um, marry the girl from high school, get a mortgage on a house in some sh shithole town and just drink at the weekends to forget about your dreams, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's, and my family was like, my, I come from a family, my, both my parents are alcoholics and, and they're very like unambitious people. And that's not even just them. I mean, my, where I come from, most people were kind of of a similar it's very hard, poor working class area. Do you know what I mean? And, um, you know, if you had dreams to do anything, they would be shut down because they were like, well, they'd be like, you know, how are you going to make money doing that? Or they'd laugh at you or just a very net. It's just a very negative world that where in, you were never, I never felt encouragement from my like teachers or my parents or any, any sort of peers or anything. It was mostly all just, negative stuff to put you down and even i even looking back in my friends from growing up in high school when I, I i think about interactions and people that i used to give a lot of time to or respect I'm like even those people were putting me down or say negative things so so when you're when you you live that life your whole life and that's what your reality is you just start to start to believe it mm -hmm. and i was 35 by the time by that, that time when I'm talking about school, yeah. and that was the first time in my life where professionals in an industry or whatever, or just people that I respected were like, hey, you're good at this and gave me some positive um, encouragement and reinforcement. And, uh, and that had never happened to me before. And that's kind of all, that's kind of all I needed, you know? Oh, a hundred percent. I don't think, and this is why I, I mean, and I'm and right now, I mean, you know, I do a lot of therapy and self care stuff to try and like, because that's that's still in there, even though I know it's not true. It's still, it's still, it's still in there. Thirty years of that kind of um, chatter in your head, it, it, it takes a while to sort of like get out. Um, so that's why yeah. now, even when I see people who are starting to stand up or they're doing something, I always, I always try as hard as I can to encourage them because, you know maybe something I say might stick. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it just keeps them going to the next day. Do you know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. but I mean, but the, the one of the issues I find that I've just started to learn really is like, we spend so much time worried about the external world and what people think. Mm -hmm. And we don't spend enough time thinking, well, what do I think? How do I feel? What's going on inside that? What, like what I, who I am and what I think and what I feel and what I want to do is more important. But we always go, no, I'm worried about what this person thinks or what society thinks or I'm worried. So, so we give too much time to the external and I definitely did. And when I look back, I'm like, oh, I, I want you to do all these things. I had the feelings that I wanted to do these things, but I never had the confidence or the, the self-trust or respect or to actually do them. Mm -hmm. So I'm just sitting there going, well, this guy thinks it's silly. And so I don't do it, but this guy doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. Hey, man. Um, I, I get what you're saying. And like, uh, we do think too much. Like, I honestly think like, uh, I know when you said Glasgow, like that kind of culture does seem like really harsh. 
I, I think there's like that kind of culture all around though, like in a similar sense, like there is like this thing that tries to keep people from really like looking inside themselves and really getting that self-expression because like when, when you do that, that like, honestly, that kind of self-expression can always be the most dangerous for society just for like the powers to be kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, like anytime you really try something different, or yeah, if you try something different or try to change yourself to like uh, radically and like people might go like, hey, what are you doing? Or like, dude, don't even talk about that. That's never going to happen. Like you'll get that everywhere. So like, yeah, like the how you're turning yourself into a guy who tries to encourage people. Like I, I try to do the exact same thing, especially with young people who are in the comedy game, who I see that are actually working at it and they're putting in the work, they're putting in the effort and all that stuff I like to actually go and try to give them encouragement because like I do understand like how that's needed and like I, I, I try to tell people in any part of your life it doesn't have to be comedy like when you're trying to like change yourself or when you're trying to pursue a dream or when you're trying to like actually express something that's like a deep feeling inside yourself you're going to have two types of people the people who encourage you to go down that path and you're going to have the other type of people who will tell you not to and tell you that you're crazy or tell you you shouldn't be doing that. And like, yep. you should be aware of that and you should know who you're spending the most time with. Well, that's something that's something that I realized too, because um, comedy can be a very toxic industry, as we know, right? Mm -hmm. um, and something I realized was a couple, was it, well, I guess it was two years ago. I forget because COVID has just ruined my idea of what time was. But um, <laughs> I think it was two years ago, around this time, I went to a 10-day silent meditation um, up north uh, a few hours from uh, Toronto. And um, it, 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 blew my, it blew my mind. And uh, I, mean, I can talk about that more later if you want. But the one thing that it did for me was because when I came out of this, this meditation, I felt so calm present full of joy bliss and just happiness and just like real but present that like, that's what being present is i guess just no anxiety no depression no worries not it was it was like almost like a drug-like experience because i'd never experienced anything like that before so i came out of this 10 day um meditation feeling invincible you know mm -hmm. and i was so happy and then when i and then a couple of days later i went to comedy bar and I'm seeing all the comics for the first time in weeks. And I just hear people talk and it's just negative. Oh, I'm not getting this. I, I want that. And just entitlement and not happy about someone was talking about how they didn't get some like, I don't know, festival or something. Right. But this person who was talking about it was complaining so much about it. Right. And it was just like bringing my vibe down because this person, if you looked at what their career was on paper and all the stuff they'd done, it's like, I would be happy with a career like that. Mm -hmm. but they're just like moaning and complaining. And it was just like, and then, I, so I was like, I, then I realized I was like, after I stopped drinking, I cut out every toxic person and pretty much every toxic thing that I was doing in my life. Right. And then I thought to myself, do I need to quit comedy? Cause comedy is a very toxic place. Mm -hmm. And then I spoke to uh, a comedian. Uh, it was Courtney Gilmore. Actually, I spoke to is a very positive comedian. Like she's she's very positive. Courtney Gilmore, uh, you said. A whole, who? Who who was the comedian? Courtney Gilmore. Oh yeah, know? Courtney. Love Courtney. So, yeah, yeah. Courtney's a very positive person mm -hmm. and very encouraging and very like just you know has that kind of attitude. So I said, and, and, and that's someone who's done very well in their yeah, career she's stand up as well. Ass. Yeah, yeah. So so I said to Courtney, I told her this story, and I said, Sh should I quit comedy because I feel like there's just all this negative, toxic, uh sort of like energy mm -hmm. and she said she she said like there's a lot of positive people who are encouraging in comedy you just need to find those people and not hang out with the other people mm -hmm. and i'd never really given that much thought before and that's what i do now so it's like and that's what i did before but even before comedy i'd be hanging out with all these people and they'd all be either not very encouraging of you or they'd be toxic kind of people too and I didn't realize that you could just not have them in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I do now is I try to keep myself with people who are um, 
are positive. They're trying to do stuff with their life. They're encouraging of me. I'm encouraging of them. We're supportive. And I don't, I, and anyone who comes into my life now who isn't like that, I, I, well, I, don't, I just don't have people like that in my life anymore. Um, and that was a very powerful thing that happened because my whole life I'd be hanging out with people who were toxic and negative and not good for me. Mm-hmm. Hey man. Um, and I think that's like a thing now with like a lot of people going through like spiritual work, like they get to places like yourself where you can be very present and then you kind of see things like that's when, when you get into that, really that stage of presence with meditation, you can go to a comedy club like that and like, or you can go to any place where your regular interactions are and just kind of see like the underlying patterns that are like kind of like influencing people. But Mm. it's true when you get that, like there is that, uh, an impulse in you that kind of goes like, oh, should I leave this area? It's too toxic. And like, the other thing is like, why not like the whole world, you can find toxic places everywhere. It's all around us. Like the whole point we're supposed to be doing is like, become that like positive like aspect like you can grow that positive aspect you yourself have created so many shows you yourself have like brought like a lot of comics together and like given like people with like a positive spin and like encouragement and shit like that and like I think that's a way healthier way to look at it rather than try to be like oh I need to retreat from this there's just too much toxicity why don't you why don't you put out that positivity? Why don't you put out that encouragement and shit like that? Because you can, we can change communities and change cultures and shit like that. It just, it takes time and it takes dedication and it takes people, people like not retreating. Like we don't need to retreat against uh, toxicity. We just need to stand up to to it, right? Well, I mean, one thing I've realized for since stopping drinking and stuff, you see, you, you see how toxic the world is set up in general um and also doing a bit of spiritual work you kind of see the negativity in the world the unhappiness in the world and you see it everywhere and it's very hard to avoid but the harder work is going instead of going well fuck this or just jumping back into that world the harder work is going okay no this is this is a thing that i reject and doing the work to create the reality that is for yourself like you can create you can create the life that you want you just have to find the right people or the right mindset but it's hard work and it's very hard work and sometimes it's exhausting sometimes it's not as rewarding as just going down the easy route of fitting in with everyone um and sometimes it can feel very lonely because you think that you're the only person going Mm -hmm. through that but what happens is once you get into that world slowly you find all these other people who are doing the same thing, who maybe are further down the path and they can help you or you find podcasts or books or, or, and, and there's a world that I never knew existed um, mm-hmm. before I got sober. Uh, that's just changed my whole, my whole life. Um, so, but, but that's the problem is it's like it, some, you sometimes feel that like you're going to be a social outcast or something like that because of it because we're also like like encouraged to be part of this negative society right um and it just takes a bit of work to go no you know what fuck this i don't i don't like it it's not working for me so you got to figure out what works for you but that but it, it's what i've realized is our, our life is too easy sometimes but it doesn't bring happiness easy no. like happiness man so the harder things are the better the reward really and the better your life's going to become. I mean, even when I stopped drinking, right? As soon as I stopped drinking, I didn't, I didn't have this thought. I didn't try to do anything like this. But as soon as I stopped, all these great people came into my life. My new friends who I hang out with now, they just appeared. I didn't go, I need to get friends who are better for me or whatever. They just came into my life. They just somehow, once you just, there's somehow you put that energy into the universe, man it just comes back to you. And I can't, I don't know how, what that, that explanation of that is, but that is, is a real thing. No, it a hundred percent is a weird thing. Uh, it is a weird thing. When you, when you do actual change and transformation, like to yourself, 
you are changing like the energy you put out like even on like a like i i'm no scientist but like on even on like a molecular level like your whole body your physiology has changed so like actual like hormones and uh, like neuro or like chemicals your body is like producing has changed and like you'll see changes in your face your all of that shit and that's going to attract different kind of people into your life oh. and that attitude that you have it's like a huge thing that's just going to attract different people into your life. And like, I'll, I'll, honestly, it's like, it, it's something that you like, uh, it's just something you need to do because I know you said um, it's not, uh, it might not be easy to like uh, change and all that stuff, but like, trust me, it's not going to be easy not to change either. Like you don't want to go down that road. It's just because you just find yourself, like five or 10 years down the road, just in a shittier spot. And like, you destroyed your body, you destroyed your mental health. And now you're even in a harder spot to get out of it. So like, um, both, both choices are hard, like choose the hard choice that at least gives you a lot more freedom and a lot more like a fulfilling life at the end of it. Right. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's, it's been crazy how much my life has changed since I made the decision to stop drinking. And that's really all that happened really is I just made that decision and like everything happened. I started getting better gigs, you know, uh, I started like, I started dating more, mm. you know, I like, you know, I thought like being sober, you would never get, you never get laid or, or meet anyone or whatever, <laughs> but that, but that's one of the reasons, you know, like what all the reasons why I drank was like to have more friends to be like, you know, I always thought you'd have to be drunk to attract the woman or be out in a party or whatever, or um, not have social anxieties and stuff. And actually I'm better, I'm more confident in life in general, being sober. And I never thought all the things I, I all these things that I created in my head, I'm not this, I'm not that, I, I need this to be like that. Um, I just changed in my mindset and I'm slowly, and in, in, again, that's been four years, but I feel like my, this next part, my mindset's changing even more because I just started my own business, which I never thought I could do. That's what I did during lockdown. And that's created a new world as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, and because I just started to make did this new business, it was just going great. And I, I was like, oh, I can also do this. It's like, you just need to, it's so, it's, it's hard to even explain, but it's like, you just change your mindset and you can change your life. And it seems like an easy thing to say, but it's really hard because there is you've 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 got these bad habits or you've you've had these you've grown up thinking a certain way. But the reality is you don't have to you can reject that and you can create the life you want. And I'm start even even now I'm starting my mindset's changing again, you know, for it's even sure. a better reason. It's, so it's always changing. Like you have to just kind of uh, understand that like get that uh, understanding that it's always changing so like that, you control the direction of the change well see this is the thing so i never thought i would ever even be able to stop drinking and stuff and the reason why i i, I will talk about sobriety and stuff like that is because i i didn't know it was possible to do this and i just need people i want people to know that if they're stuck like that or they're having problems that you can get out of it because I'm, I was a mess. If you'd have known me five years ago, I was a fucking mess. I was a loser. I didn't have anything going on with my life. I didn't want to have anything going on in my life. You know, I was just, I, you know, you know, you'd look at someone like me and be like, this guy's just a waste of space. Mm. And, and flipped in like four years later, I've just I've changed everything around. So like when people go, oh, you can't change, you're always going to remain the same and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's total bullshit because you definitely can. And I'm living proof of it. And that's why I always try and help out anyone that asks because I was just, I was a fucking idiot. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can do it. I'm no one special, you know? So but what, just, uh, so when you uh, like decided to like uh, become sober, like how long of a process was it? Was it literally just like one day you just spent like mm. fuck this or was it like a it like a, an overtime kind of thing uh it was a bit of both uh, i explained so i kind of was like I, I noticed a few a few years before i got sober i was kind of in this place where i was like i didn't like drinking 
it, I, I didn't like being drunk. I was kind of just, it was, I was, I was trying to quit. I, I, I didn't think about quitting full stop because I didn't even, again, I didn't think that that was a thing. I kind of was like, okay, I'll quit for a few months. I'll quit for a month. I'll quit for six months. I'll quit for three months. But I always knew I'd go back to drinking. So this went on for a couple of years. I tried to stop a couple of months down the line. I'd start drinking again. So, and then what actually happened was, and it, 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 I never, like, you know, people always talk about like a rock bottom or something, but there wasn't really a, a, a defining moment. One day I was, what actually happened was I was doing a show. At, do you remember Hotbox? The, the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the place there, right? So for anyone listening, it's like a, a show inside a cannabis uh, store. So everyone's smoking weed. Um, so I, I'm there doing a show and I come out and I'm I'm a little bit buzzed from the smoke. You know what I mean? You come out that, you oh, never yeah. smoke anything there. You come out high as anything. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I come out of there and I'm with um, Ben Boschman, um, another comedian. And he's like, you want to go see a movie? So we went to see a movie. Um, before the movie, I had one beer. He had a beer. I went to see the movie with him. The next day, I woke up and I was like, "I'm I, I'm done with drinking." And then that was it. That was that it. was it. It was it. Just one day, I woke up and I just didn't do it. Again. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I tried all these times, mm-hmm. but there wasn't like I never. It it wasn't like sort of pre-planned. It just kind of I woke up one day and I was just like, you know what? That's it. I'm done. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I read a book as well, which um, afterwards, at the, and as soon as I finished this book, and I recommend it to anyone who wants to get sober, it's called um, Stop Drinking Now by Alan Carr. Oh, I've heard this book so many times. Like, it seems like it's like the like it's, Bible of quitting drinking, eh? Well, it's it just, I mean, I haven't read it since I read it, but like, it, it just put drinking into such a, the way he describes alcoholism and addiction and sobriety and stuff like that it was just so easy to understand and it made a lot of sense things that that's when you read it you go oh that's so obvious i never thought about that and when, when i read this book i was like there's no way i can read a book and i'll, I'll stop drinking sort of thing um but i i don't i don't really know but i i kind of felt that i was being hypnotized or something when i was reading this book or my, maybe that's the wrong, maybe that's the wrong thing. I think my mindset was changing as I was reading this book and he, he, the way he did that was changing my mindset. So it felt like I was being hypnotized because I was, I could feel my, my mind changing. And I remember I turned the last page and I was like, yeah, that's, yeah, I don't want, and I've never wanted to drink ever since I've, there's been a couple of times where I thought about it. And I walked one time I was in Montreal and I was, I, I, I was just like, fucking, I don't know what had happened, but I was really pissed off. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go have a drink. Fuck it. I, I just, and I walk into, a, and I was going to do it. I was just, I was just going to have one beer. I wasn't going to get drunk. I was just like, you know what? I, I want to see if I can just have a beer. Cause I felt a bit lonely being sober. I think that's what it was. I was like a bit, a little bit lonely. So I was like, maybe I can have a beer and then I can go back into like society. If you know what I mean? And I walk into a bar and I was like, I'm going to do it. No one was around. So I was like, I wasn't going to tell anyone. I was just going to do it. And I walk into the bar and I just physically and mentally could, I just walked in and I was just like, nah, nah, not doing it. Turned away. And there's, it it just, I I think this book just changes your mindset and it just How like, uh, what kind of, what does it kind of tell you? Cause I know like everyone who's explained this book to me, it really, from what I hear, I uh, remember it's like he really nails into like just the benefits of alcohol and just like realizing that there isn't, it really isn't much, right? He basically he basically breaks down the myths of uh, the the lies that we've been told about alcohol, what alcohol actually is, what addiction actually is. Um, um, just put he puts stuff in such simple ways. I wish I could remember the book more, but like. I remember one part of the book, he was like, you know, he, he just, oh, fuck, I, I can't even, I wish I could remember more. Sorry, but um, it just, he also breaks down why things like um, 
12 step in any recovery program doesn't work. Um, I remember because he says like, you know, because I think he said the people are in recovery or doing AA, they think that they're, they're in AA because they don't want to drink. They're trying, they're, you're using a support network to stop them from drinking. But what actually their, their mindset is this, that they think they're missing out something in their life that is good for them, but they can't have it. But what he's saying is basically like, once you get in the mindset of going like, this is not good for you. Like, like you wouldn't drink a bottle of bleach under the sink. Mm -hmm. I think was his example. And it's a poison to your body. So you're not actually missing anything. And I think what he was saying with like recovery communities, which do do good, good work. But what he's saying was like why people go back on the booze or they relapse and stuff is because they go, oh, I'm missing something good here and I want it back. But what they don't actually realize is the cause of their misery. Um, he probably says it in a more elegant way for sure. But like, <laughs> like <laughs> but, but, it, but, you know, it just made sense. No, that does and make sense. Actually, since then, I've read, I've read his book about uh, smartphone addiction and emotional eating. And he basically says the same things, but uses it with smartphones. And it's like, uh, you know, because alcohol is such a big thing in society. It's like you, you drink for, you drink when you're, you're happy. You drink when you're sad. You, you drink to socialize. You drink on occasion. You know, everything's yeah. geared around drinking. And honestly, my, like, uh, the way you said it with, like, dating, that was freaking uh, my, uh, yeah. like, when I'm dating, like, I usually go, like, hey, let's go grab a drink kind of thing, yeah. especially when I was in Toronto, like, I loved, uh, like, Toronto just has, like, the best restaurants and bars and shit like that, and there's just hundreds of them you always want to check out, like, that was kind of my thing, like, what do you change now with dating when you're, like, uh, you don't even, because uh, I guess you don't want well, to go to a bar anymore. Or... Yeah, dating, you have to put a bit more thought into your dates now. Yeah. Uh, you can't, <laughs> you we're we're think... going fucking parasailing. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. You know? <laughs> but yeah, but that's the thing. You can't set the bar too high because you've got to go on a couple of dates, right? <laughs> you you know? Yeah, yeah. you got to like... slowly go. But So um, dating, I find, is still, it's still not, I'll be honest, I, I, I'm more confident to ask someone out now um and um so that's a, that's a new thing for me i i never used to do it because i was too scared i was too shy i was too scared of rejection or whatever um and i would only ever approach girls when i was drunk you know and they were drunk you know mm -hmm. um because i guess i didn't have the self-confidence or belief in myself so um so and what i realized is um you know girls are i mean you know, I, I think a girl or, I mean, most people want to date someone who isn't a fucking mess, right? Yeah. So people, girls are more interesting guys who actually are, are sober. Do you know what I mean? Because, um, you know, they've dated fucking idiots or people who are abusive or they're, um, you know, they're just a fucking mess or, or how many other stories that alcohol or drugs or whatever has been. So, um, but the only, the only difficulty I find is, if someone else drinks and they're used to drinking is I think they get a bit weird being on a date sober because they use a drink to calm their nerves. Right. Mm -hmm. So then they worry that there are people are always like, Oh, do you mind if I drink? And like, I don't care. Like if someone drinks, it's not, you know, you're not going to, I think there's a, I think there's a, a there's a, as a, a world that you think if, if I, if someone puts a drink in front of me, it's going to trigger me to drink. Yeah, That's not yeah. Alcoholism works. Do you know what I mean that that's not going to? Maybe for some people, but I don't think for most people it's like that. And so then they'll have the they'll either have a drink, but then they, I can see they get nervous about how much they're drinking because they feel like I might be judging them or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Which I'm not, right? Or the opposite, where they're sober and they're very nervous. So it 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 takes a it takes um. You have to. It's got me better at like things like small chat and conversation making people feel more comfortable because if you drink then you start gabbing and stuff like that. you have a couple of drinks you're loose yeah, yeah. But, so i need to be the person that comes and brings the energy on a date and then that person gets over the nerves and then they relax and then it's fine you know and uh, that's uh, that's awesome yeah but date but like thinking of dates to do is is kind of hard because the, you know you can't 
Yeah, there's only so many cups of coffee you can drink in yeah. one day. <laughs> so many, you know, so like, many walks through a park you could take to. Yeah, I just drink water, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, but but I will say, you don't make, I you don't like hook up or make mistakes anymore. That's the thing. You don't just sleep with whoever. You don't sleep with toxic people. You don't you don't date toxic people, because. You, you know, you, you, you can see those people now and they, they, they just, you, you attract a different type of person when you're sober, I think as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it is difficult. Toronto's a difficult place to date in general. Oh, so you think be, so? Yeah, I think so. Uh, okay. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's just a me thing. But I no, think. no, I, I, I like, <laughs> I've been to many cities. I thought like just, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just thinking like Toronto size is kind of the reason it's like not too bad. Like I, no, I always a, thought it's a hard place to get into a relationship. Yes, that's what I mean. That's yeah, what I mean. Okay. You can go on a date for yeah, sure. Yeah, going but on it, a date, it's not too hard there, I didn't think. Yeah. But well, what, I, what actually there, yeah. happens with things like dating is like when you when you drink, when you're dating, you can go on a drink, a, a date with someone and maybe you don't even like them that much, but you have a few drinks and then you can end up hooking up with them or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But with this now, it makes you go, okay, what? who am I looking for? What is it I'm looking for? Is it a relationship? Is it whatever? Uh, and then you kind of go, what kind of girl am I looking for? Those are the things I never really asked myself, right? So you start thinking more about what you want from relationships. Oh, yeah. And that's another thing with Sprite. It's not just uh, dating. It's like you start thinking, what do I want more out of life? You're not just wasting it you know yeah yeah that soft. kind of goes back to your like earlier saying of just like we're always so focused on the external like we need to go inside and be go internal and like actually ask those questions what do i want what do i feel like like those things because you want to create the life of what you want rather than like going for whatever like worried about what everybody else thinks right yeah it's it's crazy that we spend so much of our lives worried about what other people think and no one's thinking about you. That's the thing. <laughs> They're all, yeah. No yeah, one's yeah. thinking. No one cares. O- the only thing, you see, people, what I've realized is the, the real people in your life, when you when you do something good with your life, people be, are very encouraging, right? But if you're not, and, and people will build you up. And anyone who's negative is just someone who's projecting their own bullshit onto you anyway, so you can, you can ignore them anyway. But but no one's sitting there going, I wonder what John's up to or, 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 you know, or even if you have a bad set in comedy, no one's like, oh, that guy's an idiot or whatever, right? No one remembers, you know? So we spend so much time in our own heads worried about people that, that, that don't exist. Or I've spent, or t- going back to dating, right? I spent so many years thinking that I wasn't good enough to date girls that I wanted to date because... You know, they they already have a boyfriend, or they don't want to date me because I'm a loser. That's the kind of mindset I had. But you know, once you get over that, you go, no, you can just like, like, um, you just you just change your mindset, and you just go, it doesn't matter because even if you ask a girl out and she says no, and you go, okay, you know. Yeah. What I yeah. what I found is when you ask a girl out, they usually say yeah, you know. But yeah. that's maybe- <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, this fucking guy here. All right. <laughs> no, I, fucking, but, we don't all have beautiful Scottish accents. No, right? I know, but I don't mean it like that, but I mean <laughs> it like kidding. um I know, I know. I said, <laughs> but I mean it like um I mean it like you're so in your head mm-hmm. thinking, oh this girl's gonna say no, that you don't do it. Hell yeah. You know, but yeah, yeah. but you're never gonna know. I was just re- I read a quote recently. I can't remember what it was in some book. It said, "Well, you're not gonna you're not in the game if you don't play, you know." And that, that is like if you're not if if you're worried about doing stand up comedy, so you never do stand up comedy, which I did for years. You're never gonna get anywhere if you're not writing jokes. You're never gonna get better at comedy if you don't ask girls out. They're not gonna they're not gonna know you want to date them, you know. So, you know, if if you don't take the chances to change your life, nothing's gonna change. Hell yeah. And no one's going to, no one, no, not one person, not, not your mother or anyone who loves you dearly, not one of them can do it for you. They can encourage you. They can be there for you. They can support you, but they can't actually do it. Mm-hmm. And you got to, like, you got to do it yourself. Hell yeah. And also just realize that rejection isn't that bad. Like 
it doesn't yeah. matter in the dating world it doesn't matter in the in your career world like asking for what you want like we're always so fucking scared of doing it but asking for what you want like the worst you can get back is a no and like a lot of the times that you don't even get that back you get what you want <laughs> wait and that see this is see, this is what i realized is when you start asking you actually usually get what you want i mean you can't just be like can you get me a million dollars and someone gives you but like if, if you're like, for example, like, you know, if you don't ask for a showcase for a festival, the festival doesn't know that you're interested. Yeah. And huh? yeah. And they're not I, sitting I there going like, like, what's that, John yeah. up to? We want yeah. John. <laughs> you're like, why don't they think of me? It's like, I know they should, they should. If you're listening from festivals, you should think of me. But, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean is, but what I mean is I, I would sit back and go, I wouldn't ask for a spot on a show when I was new because I was worried I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't ask for a festival spot. I wouldn't ask for, for, I wouldn't ask for anything because I didn't think I deserved it or I thought I'd say no, or I created an ex, the external thing of this, it put out that energy of like, oh, well, I'm going to get rejected, so I'm not going to bother. And what actually happens is generally people go, you say, yeah. Or one time, one time I didn't get a showcase uh, at, uh, just for laughs. Uh, it was my friend who was booking the, the show. And I got mad at him and I said, what? I, I've, I've, we've been friends for this long and I worked for him for Empire Comedy, right? And I was like, I was like, why are you not putting me on the showcase? I mean, I, do I not get a shot, right? And I, I was like very, sounding very entitled when I come back. But he said, he's like, you've never asked. So how do I know that you want it? I can't just assume. Yeah. That you, and then, then I was like, yeah. Why should I be so self-involved to think that he thinks that I want a showcase, right? Mm-hmm. So, Again, you, again, that's another thing I've learned in sobriety and like, you know, trying to do stuff with your life is like, you got to ask for things you want, you know? And again, if, 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 they, if they say no or you get rejected, that's fine. And then there's another path to go down. Hell yeah. You know? Or you maybe have to, or, or, or whatever it is you want, you might just have to work it a little harder to get it because say you didn't get a showcase for Just for Laughs, just let's use that as an example. You go, okay. Well, maybe I'm not working hard enough and not enough people are realizing maybe I'm not good enough to be on the festival yet. But that doesn't mean I I don't ask again. It means I go home, I start writing jokes, I start getting on stage more, I start trying to figure out my voice or I start trying to figure out where I've gone wrong. So, and what I used to do is like when things would get hard, I quit and go fuck it, right? But what I realize now is a failure is a good thing. When you fail at something, you learn. It's not a failure per se. Failure is a bad word. It gets a bad rep. But when you fail, it's just a learning point. You don't actually fail and that's the end of your life. It just means, what did I learn from that? Did, did, I, did I not prepare? Did, uh, am I not ready? Or, or was this the wrong person to ask or whatever? Mm-hmm. And then you just learn and you go, okay, wh- how could I do that better next time? Or what, what was the learning point? So that's what I've realized. I was always so scared of the fear of failure. But now I, I go, what's the learn? And I fail all the time. I get bomb on stage. I fuck up my business. I, you know, I do the, you know, but I, but now instead of like eating my feelings or running away from stuff, I just go, okay, well, how, how do I make that better next time? And, and the thing is, if you fail at something, no one's, no one cares. No one remembers. Yeah. The only person who remembers is you. Yeah, so yeah. you just have to go, okay, let's just pick yourself up and let's go again. And, and then I find that you learn so much about yourself and about life by fucking up. Um, but you got to try. You got to try. try. Yeah. No one's handing you anything, you know? And even if they did, you wouldn't enjoy it. So that's another thing. You got to enjoy the process of what you're doing. You got to try. You got to fail. You got to pick yourself up a million times. You got to be rejected a hundred times. You just got to keep going. And you just got to not quit. Mm-hmm. every time you fail you just figure out a different way right and that's that's kind of my mindset now with stuff but it's taken fucking i'm 40 now so it's taken almost fucking half my life to figure that out hey man hey, as long as like uh the best thing you can do is like what you're doing like uh encourage younger people that you're around uh help them find their like uh find that kind of like positive mindset as well and like yeah that's like honestly that's what we need to be doing is like find that community and shit like that and like uh, make these values uh, hopefully uh, more known. Uh, but like, hey, John, fucking uh, this was amazing. 
I got to ask you the question of the podcast. So, uh, John Molston, God, yay or nay? God, yay or nay? Like, does God exist? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a deep, that's a... It's it is a deep question. That's you want it just a yeah or nay, or do you want? <laughs> no, uh, well, actually, you can if you if that's what you want to give. Or a lot I of people I, go I don't, a little I don't, bit more. I don't think. I'd like to think. I'm not against the idea of God existing. I I I hope there is a God. I don't know. I I'd like there to be. I I I don't know. I don't think the. I'm not. I don't know if I'm a fan of the religious gods that are currently. People. I don't know. Religion, I don't like too much, but I like the idea that there's a God. I like the, I'm not against the idea of it, but I, I, I don't like the idea that there's not a God because then there's kind of like, you know, like atheists, they're, like they're always the most, atheist people are the most miserable cunts you'll ever meet in your life because it, <laughs> they get nothing. Because, it, well, the one thing I do like about religion is it gives you faith and it gives you a purpose because that's what I like about people who are religious. They have faith in God. So it gives them a purpose to do stuff in their life because they're doing it for God. So even if you don't believe in the religious God, you got to believe in something to make life have a purpose. So, um, so I say, yeah. Okay. That's the easier answer. Is that? Yeah, man. I, I like that answer. It's uh can't complain about that. Uh, all right, John, uh, this was great. Um, no, thanks so much. Yeah, actually, uh, like I want you to like let people know where they can get a hold of you, but uh, tell people what you've been working on during the lockdown, because uh, people in Toronto would uh, definitely be interested. In, uh, you started like a little business when comedy went down. I started a, a vegan pie delivery service, so um, all the sort of classic pies that I grew up with, shepherd's pies and steak and ale and all those kind of good stuff. I, I realized during lockdown because I had nothing to do and I was I didn't have any money and stuff. I was like, I should do this. And that's actually, that's another thing I'll say quickly is, um, you know, when you go, I, years ago, I thought to myself, someone should make a vegan pie business that is, that is, does all the classics that's not meat. Right. And I was like, and I, cause I would love that. That's why I thought I was like, I would love that. I would buy that all the time. But I, in that mindset, I thought someone else should do that. Mm. Never thinking it would be me. And then I just go, and then I just did it. And that's one thing I'd like to say at the end. I just give yourself permission to start something. That's the biggest thing I had to do is just give yourself permission to do it mm. and just go for it. I just started. People always ask me, how did you, because it's going very, very well. It's called the Pylander. You can hit me up on Instagram or I'm getting a website up pretty soon. Um, so you can hit me up there. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest thing I learned from that was you can, I was like, I didn't think I was the kind of person who, started a business that's for other people that's why i used to say that's for other people right but you can just do it and if you get out your own way you can do amazing things in your life and it's mm-hmm. taken me along and i'm still in that transition of getting out my own way but opening up that pie business and it's gone so and then everyone's like oh we've been wanting this right because I, I had that film but no one's ever done it so um so that's been exciting and that's been a new world that I've gone into. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing that I did was just people always say, how do you start comedy or how do you start a business? You just got to start. Yeah. And you just, and you, all the questions you have, you'll, you'll figure it out every week I did pies. I was like, okay, how do where do I have, where do I find suppliers? So next week I find, I started off buying stuff from like no frills. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. But then I was like, okay, there must be suppliers. Where are suppliers? I find out where suppliers are. Okay, how do I how do I sell the pies? Okay, I gotta figure out Facebook groups or what's my packaging like or what kind of flip like but what the prices are. So, you know, don't let perfectionism or having all the answers off the bat stop you from doing stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the same if if you had anyone ask how do you start comedy? It's like you just start and you fucking bomb for years, but you figure it out mm-hmm. and you don't quit. That's it. You just don't quit. Yeah. Hell yeah. And uh, yeah, for anybody who's in Toronto, get this man's pies. It's uh, they're fucking great. Uh, when I was uh, back there in the summer, I was loving yes. them. I know, um, I'm missing your custom. I, I need you back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And like, actually, that's a good thing when you're saying like, uh, just try it, just do it. And like, uh, you'll be surprised who supports you. Like you'll get the uh, support from like, when I started the podcast, I was surprised with like where my support came from. And like everyone, like, 
everyone wants you to do well. And if you're doing something cool that, that's very you, people will support you. I was overwhelmed by the amount of support for pies. I thought people would laugh at me or I'd fuck it up. People are encouraging me. People share shit. People want you to, people want you to succeed. And anyone who doesn't is not someone that you need in your life anyway. And they're just projecting their own unhappiness. So you will, if, if you're, and that's one thing, oh, I, I sorry to wrap it on, but like when I got sober, I didn't know how to get sober. And so what I did was I was so lost. I posted on Facebook. I need to get sober. I'm a fucking mess. I can't remember what I posted, but it was something like that. And so many people that I didn't even know who I never really met in comedy in life messaged me. They would meet up with me for coffee. They would check in on me. So if you're stuck and you're having a hard time or you're trying to start something and you don't know what to do, you'll realize that people are awesome. You just got to tell, that's the thing about ask. People don't know that you want something or there's something wrong with you unless you tell them. You got to tell people. Mm. Asking for help sounds hard, but as soon as you do it, you realize it's actually one of the best things to do because people will help you and you help other people. And it's just people and human beings are awesome. You know, Um, they really are at the core. People are really great. Don't worry about what's online and on Twitter. Your people in your life, they're great. They'll help you, you know? Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, no, that's a really nice way to end it. Uh, so, yeah, check out uh, Pylander on Instagram uh, if you are in Toronto. And uh, check out uh, John Moston. Is it just at John Moston? No, it's at Moston Comedy, I think. Um, at, at Moston Comedy. But I'll, you, there's, I'll... There's, there's not much content on there these days because <laughs> So. <laughs> <laughs> i'll uh, definitely add that as well to the podcast awesome. description but uh john yo thank you so much this was a oh, lot of fun thanks for having me that was a lot of fun thank you so much